great to see uh, so many people uh, here today for AlterCon Portland. Um, my name is Aditya, and today we will be taking a decolonial lens looking at, uh, yeah, well, today we'll be taking a decolonial lens looking at Unicode. We'll be asking a fairly simple question, straightforward question, which is, can we type every word that's ever been written in the history of humanity? Whether that's you know, written on paper or parchment or chiseled into stone. And this is a tall order because this doesn't just mean being able to write English and Chinese and Hindi and Arabic, but it also means being able to write things like Egyptian hieroglyphics or the Minoan script Linear A. And there are three parts to this talk. First, we need to understand what we mean when we're talking about decolonization and Unicode. Then, we'll be looking at what some of the problems in Unicode are. We'll be looking both at some of the specific decisions that are problematic, as well as structural problems with Unicode as a project. And finally, we'll be looking at how we can fix some of these problems. So what is decolonization? In a word, decolonization is a process of actively reversing the influence of and the damage caused by, an, by a hegemonic, imperial, or oppressive power. And I want to drill down into the uh, influence aspect of this, because damage is pretty easy for us to wrap our heads around, especially when it's uh, you know, military violence or physical uh, concrete damage. But influence is also actually uh, an important part of uh, colonization and decolonization. Because if we treat European uh, cultures and user experiences as the default, then that represents a form of influence of these powers as well. And so decolonization means removing that structural influence. An example uh, in, in language elsewhere would be the French Academy. That's an institution that, among other things, explicitly minimizes the extent to which dialects of French that are spoken in Africa are able to influence what's perceived as the official French language as spoken in France. As for Unicode, it's easiest to explain what Unicode is by demonstrating the problem that it solves. So I like to call this the ATM problem. Um, who here has seen something like this? You might see it on old websites where instead of seeing an apostrophe, you would see a nonsense sequence of characters. And when this problem happens, it's consistent. Every time you see an apostrophe on that page, it will, re it will be replaced by that exact same non uh, nonsense sequence of characters. Well, here's what's actually happening there. Computers, remember, only actually see numbers. So to write something on a computer, you're typing, uh, you're typing characters, but those get translated into numbers that this computer stores. And then on the other end, the computer that's displaying it takes those numbers and figures out how to map those numbers back into characters. So if we wanted to write the phrase, hello with an exclamation mark and a smiley face emoji, the computer just sees a sequence of these numbers, 72, 69, 76, etc. And then on the other end, the computer has to have that same dictionary to go in reverse from what those numbers actually translate back into. And the, pro and the problem, uh, of course, with the ATM problem is that the, the two computers are using different mappings. They're using two different uh, sets of dictionaries, essentially, that, that, tell, that uh, translate from numbers to characters and, and vice versa. And so Unicode aims to solve this problem by providing a unique number for every character, no matter what the platform, no matter what the program, and no matter what the language. The idea being that if we have a universal character set, that universal mapping that encompasses every single character that's ever been written in humankind, then we can agree on what, how those numbers uh, map to characters and vice versa, and we'll never have these issues where two people are using different sets of mappings. And so every single, uh, you know, every single character that, uh, that the Unicode Consortium, which we'll get to, uh, you know, has, has identified gets its own unique number. So all of these that you see right here, actually all over the page, have their own code point. They're considered a different character, yes, including that word, actually phrase, um, up on the top right. And just because, we have the, just because we have those characters doesn't mean we necessarily have the fonts to render them. Um, you'll notice that there are two like, little tofu squares. You might not actually even be able to see them, but at top. Um, that's because, in this case, Ash's computer does not have the fonts for Egyptian hieroglyphics installed, um, which is kind of not surprising. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I included that here just to show that, you know, even if we don't have the fonts to render them, we still actually have the, da the data is still there. We know what they should have represented, even if we can't, uh, even if we can't display them. So Unicode in this light is just a massive scheme for cataloging all of the characters that have ever been used in writing in humankind. And so someone has to decide what those numbers are and how those characters map to them. 
And in fact, someone has to decide what even constitutes a character in the first place, which is not an easy question. And so who, make, who gets to make those decisions? Well, anyone is uh, free to, uh, so the Unicode Consortium is, uh, is the international standards body that's in charge of this. Um, and the Unicode project was started in 1987 by engineers at Xerox and Apple. And it's now, it's now grown. And so while anyone's free to submit proposals from the public for consideration by the Unicode Consortium and its technical bodies, um, the voting decisions are, are made by its members. And there are 12, there are 12 full members um, at the moment. Membership requires payment anywhere from 7,000 to 18,000 a year. And if you look at the list of members, they generally form tech companies that uh, you know, have an inherent vested interest legitimately in uh, being able to communicate online in textual form, like you know, Google, Facebook, Apple. You know, they, they, they legitimately do care about being able to um, communicate uh, between different languages. But to use an analogy, we don't say that a representative democracy reflects the will of the people just because there is a process for the public to petition it. We also have to look at who holds those positions of power as representatives and the ways that they use that power. And so if you look through the list of people who actually represent these companies on the Unicode Consortium, and if you look through the employees and then their biographies, you can find some who studied non-European languages as second languages, but it's actually quite hard to find those who at least identify themselves as speaking a non-European language as their first language, and certainly it's uh, hard, if not impossible, to find any who only speak a non-European language and don't speak any European languages like English or French or German. And that's important because given the mission of Unicode, we can't have non-European languages being viewed primarily through the lens of speakers of European languages. That's not structurally decolonized. And you'll notice I'm not naming individual names here because at some level that's not the point. I mean, you can have a person who as an individual uh, you know, speaks a European language as their first language but has studied you know, maybe Chinese or, or East or South Asian languages um, at a scholarly level and is able to contribute, uh, you know, provide perspectives that are relevant. But at the same time, you then also have to look holistically because even if every single person as an individual is qualified to be on, that com to be on those boards and those committees, we also have to look at who's not there, who's structurally excluded from this. And as we'll see, the absence of native speakers does have impacts on the way that non-European languages and, cult and cultures as well are represented in Unicode. So what is a character? It turns out that this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer. Because we could say, well, it's a letter, it's a piece of punctuation, it's a numeral. Um, but those are actually our own biases as speakers of English and other European languages creeping in there. The Latin alphabet, which we use for English, is related historically to the Greek and Cyrillic alphabets used by Greek and Russian. And each of these uh, letters, which are different variants or derived from the Greek letter alpha, gets its own number. So even though Greek alpha and Latin A in English represent the same sound as Cyrillic A used in Russian, and, and even though they're all derived from the same source, there's never any ambiguity over which one I'm typing because when I type one, the computer stores different unique numbers for each of those characters. And so here's an interesting question. In some languages like Spanish, if you take an A and put an accent on it, it completely changes the meaning of the word. So is that a different character or are those, you know, uh, a same character but with an additional modifier attached to it? And it turns out that uh, you know, some characters have more than one number. Unicode allows you to think of it both ways. We can think of that as A with an accent as its own unique character, and it gets its own unique number. Or we can think of it as that same A, but followed by a separate character, which is a, you know, an accent mark, and those two get combined. We can think we have multiple numbers that can re uh, represent what's basically the same thing. And similarly to how European languages derive a lot of their writing systems from Greek and Latin, East Asian languages derive a large chunk of their writing systems from uh, ancient or traditional Chinese. So um, these characters right here uh, represent um, a knife or a piece of cutlery. And even if you don't speak any of these languages, you can see that you know, they, they, are they are derived from the same source, they are similar. But if I were writing a, Jap a blog post in Japanese or if I were you know, writing a Chinese newspaper, I'd want to use the appropriate variant because that's how native speakers and native writers actually you know, use their language. 
And these languages have a very different writing system from English, so there isn't a perfect analogy, but a way to think of them is like this. You know, um, in American English, I would spell the word catalog with a G at the end, but if I send you an email and you're reading that email in London, I want you still to be reading that with a G, not a G-U-E, because you know, that's authentic to the way that I've actually written uh, you know, the email that I sent you. If I'm typing the letter A in English, I don't want that replaced by a Greek alpha, even though, yes, it is technically the same sound, because, again, that's not what I'm writing. And um, I include this last example because in many cases in Chinese, these include characters that people will use in writing their names. So it's vital that we be able to encode them correctly because otherwise that would be like saying everyone who's Stephen with a PH uh, you know, has to write their name now with a V because that's all the store and you know, that's what your name is from now on. And you know, we wouldn't do that. Unfortunately though, the Unicode Consortium has pushed a rather controversial process known as Han Unification where they, they do exactly this. They say all of these variants that were derived from the same source at one point, well, th we'll just give them the same number and you, know, you can deal with it yourselves. And so uh, that's the picture below, which is what you saw previously, represents the actual variant, uh, you know, the actual form of the character that, uh, that's used in those languages. But the thing that's above, you may not be able to see it, but spoiler, it's all the same character um, in each row, represents how it actually appears because they all use the same number. And I want to be clear what's happening. It's not like the data isn't there and the fonts just mean they're not rendering properly. The data simply isn't there because we're using the same number to refer to all of these, same, all of these characters across different languages, which means that there's actually no way in our character encoding to capture those distinctions in band. And you can use out-of-band schemes if you want, like on a web browser you can use an HTML tag to say, hey, this next paragraph's in Japanese, so use Japanese-like variants of the characters. But that's not portable, as you can see here, because when I copy and paste those characters from Wikipedia into PowerPoint, which is what I did, they become different characters. They all become, you know, uh, rendered the same. So it defeats the point of having unique assignments if we can't actually disambiguate between two different characters. Um, and that's why I ended up having to take a picture, uh, screenshots of the characters just to show you what they look like because Unicode otherwise didn't give me a way to guarantee that you would actually be seeing uh, you know, the, the variants that I needed to show you. Now in their defense, languages are a really hard problem and the Unicode consortium doesn't pretend that they're perfect. So they even publish a running list of uh, known anomalies in character names. This isn't, known, this isn't problems in the characters, this is just the character names themselves. And they say, you might not be able to see this, but it says uh, the stability and uniqueness of published character names is far more important than the correctness of the name. Now, from an engineering perspective, that sounds like a sensible decision because you know, changing things up means you know, breaking code that might depend on those assumptions and it starts to get a mess. But that's really problematic because it means that now authenticity has taken a backseat to implementation convenience. We're admitting straight up that Unicode no longer represents the way that native speakers actually write and talk about their language, which is a huge problem. And I'm an engineer, and as engineers, we'd like problems to be neatly organized and contained, but if you ask any linguist, that's not how, they'll tell you that's not how languages work. Languages are messy, they're hard, they're complicated, they're inconsistent, and they evolve over time. And the people who drive those evolutions are the native speakers who read and write those languages as their only language. Uh, primary language, but in many cases only language. And it's important because if we're, t if we're going to say that we're, we'll be taking an iterative approach to diversity, that's fundamentally incompatible with this commitment to backwards compatibility. Because that means that we have to be absolutely sure that right from the start we get everything right the very first time and don't make any mistakes because we'll never be able to fix them. And as soon as we make a mistake for the very first time and accidentally privilege a European language or introduce a relic of you know, cultural hegemony, uh, we'll always be stuck with those colonial relics of structural hegemony because we'll, we've said that we'll never be able to change them. I want to take um, just a couple minutes and talk about emoji because they're probably the thing for which, they're probably the aspect of Unicode that's most familiar uh, to people who aren't engineers who don't work with text encoding on a regular basis. Um, emoji are uh, ways of representing these little cartoonish icons. Um, they start off as faces, but now they can be basically anything. 
And uh, each emoji gets its own code point. And for the longest time, all emoji faces were rendered as either a cartoonish yellow or on some platforms a green with like an alien figure. And so it's distinctly humanoid, but at the same time, very clearly not evocative of any particular race or ethnicity or color, at least not explicitly with a facial expression. But in an attempt at promoting diversity, the Unicode Consortium a few years ago introduced a scheme to specify the skin tone of emoji faces. And they used the Fitzpatrick scale, which they call a recognized standard for dermatology. Um, what they don't mention is that it's a scale that's used by dermatologists to identify a person's likelihood of developing skin cancer. <laughs> so in itself, that's a problem because skin cancer has basically nothing to do with diversity or decolonization at any level. <laughs> but from a perspective of decolonization, it's, it's even worse because it ignores structural problems with emoji while also introducing this whole new layer of problems on top of it. You see, if we took a language, just to use an analogy, if we took a language that didn't have gendered pronouns in it historically, and then suddenly decided that we're going to invent gender pronouns and then tell everyone overnight, well, now you either have to use these new gender pronouns or you have to make a conscious decision to use the older gender neutral pronouns, we would consider that a regression because we'd be actively inserting gender into interactions and communications that don't necessarily need it and you know, previously were able to get by without it. And we're, race emoji basically do the same thing because it now forces people of color to make an active decision when they use an emoji to, re to express themselves do I now actively identify myself with the, you know, the correct skin color, but then also subject myself to the you know, potential uh, discrimination and risks and visibility that, that come with all of that in a way that I didn't have to before? Or do I make a conscious decision to use the older gender, you know, sorry, race neutral uh, version of the emoji, but then erase myself and my identity online? It now becomes an active decision either way. And there's actually data that shows that um, on Twitter, uh, people who have darker skin tones are actually much less likely to use these emoji to represent themselves for that exact reason, which kind of defeats the whole point or the whole goal, but isn't surprising when you think about it. But secondly, it's problematic because it ignores the structural biases in emoji that are way more subtle than just skin tone. Um, these are three examples of emoji. Their official names are Bride with Veil, Santa Claus, and Necktie. And Bride with Veil, I mean, you can put that with as many skin tones as you want, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a Western assumption of what a bride should look like and what a bride wears. You know, in many places around the world, a bride doesn't wear a veil. And Santa Claus, I mean, Santa Claus was originally um, uh, the Bishop of Turkey, uh, then that as a myth or like as a, you know, icon evolved in the Netherlands in an unbelievably racist and problematic context. You can look that up if you, I won't get into it. Um, and then came to the U.S. via, you know, England and British culture. Um, so again, that's a very Western, uh, you know, uh, and hegemonic uh, cultural icon. And of course, a necktie, no matter who's wearing the necktie and what race they are, that's still a European assumption of what formal wear looks like. There are many icons and many you know, symbols that could have cultural relevance outside European culture that aren't considered because they, the ways in which they have uh, you know, relevance are, are much more local cultures and they just aren't considered by the deciding bodies that, um, that decide what becomes an emoji. By the way, you take a look. There was some release this week even about some of the discussions for new emojis to include. It's, uh, it, it's very enlightening to see the sorts of discussions that are had on this matter and what gets, what gets given an importance and what doesn't. So this is the part where I wish that I had a few slides that just outlined a really you know, quick and easy answer for how we could solve this and move forward and, and fix all these problems overnight, or even just what we should have done instead from the start and how we could have avoided all these problems. But unfortunately, as we've seen, languages are, they're messy. And we absolutely can criticize certain decisions that the Unicode Consortium has made. And we can and we should criticize them for structural problems like the representation of their membership and board. But as an engineer, as a polyglot, as someone who is aware of the complexities of linguistics, 
It's hard for me to come up with an easy recommendation for how Unicode could have accomplished their mission within the constraints that they've chosen about both universal, you know, being universal and portable, but also stable and backwards compatible. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe those constraints just aren't reasonable. Maybe it's not reasonable to say that we should have a character encoding that is universal and represents every piece of information that's ever been expressed in, you know, uh, in writing over the centuries, but at the same time, and is also stable and never changes, but somehow is also flexible enough to adapt to language and its needs as it evolves over you know, the entire future of humanity. But even if we don't have an answer for all of that, um, at least an easy answer, there are some principles that we can keep in mind uh, as we think about how we might you know, how we might fix this, how we might either uh, fix Unicode or fix these problems in Unicode or come up with some alternatives that either way solve the problem of digital textual communication. First, we need to understand from the start that engineering convenience can never be an excuse to, sa to sacrifice authenticity, specifically authenticity with respect to the way that native speakers are writing and using the language on a daily basis. And if anyone ever tries to tell you that we need things like Han unification for simplicity and for, you know, for convenience because otherwise it would be too complicated to actually implement, let me tell you that we've ended up with the worst of all worlds, where we now have these simplifications, but we've layered on all these hacks to you know, unsimplify them and still solve all these problems. And in the end, uh, you know, it's just as complicated if we, as if we'd actually you know, gotten this right from the get-go. So just honestly tell them to come talk to me or anyone who's worked on text encodings, honestly, and to find out how complicated these simplifications uh, actually are to implement. And secondly, I mean, this is Ultracon, so I don't think I should have to say that you know, diversity and representation matters as a principle, but I want to highlight a reason that it matters. Because if we want to make a universal encoding for all text that is used by anyone who speaks and writes any language around the world, we need to make sure that we have qualified linguists and engineers um, around the world who are qualified to talk about this uh, admittedly highly technical, highly specialized um, problem space. It's not enough for us to say, well, there are no Arabic speakers who are qualified enough in text encoding, so you know, we can't do it. Because first of all, that's wrong. There are native Arabic speakers who are qualified enough in text encoding. But, even if that were true for Arabic or for any other language, because we want to solve all languages, if there aren't any people who speak those languages who are qualified enough to comment on this on a technical level, then that's still our problem. Because we're the ones who've taken this on as our mission to provide a universal character set, to provide, to provide a universal vocabulary for everyone around the world. And so if there aren't people who speak those languages who are qualified enough to participate in that decision-making process, then that's our fault, either for taking that on as our mission or for not giving them the opportunities to become uh, you know, technical and specialized and well-versed enough to comment on these. And so finally, if we want to decolonize Unicode, we can't have gatekeepers making decisions about languages which they don't speak as native speakers, because that right there is, te is textbook colonial control. If you want to learn more about these problems uh, or to you know, get involved in working towards a solution, um, I posted some links on Twitter um, and you can, uh, you can find them there. My handle is Chimera Coder, uh, C-H-I-M-E-R-A-C-O-D-E-R. And we need to solve these problems because if we don't fix these structural problems, that means that Unicode would be the first time in history that the writing systems for languages around the world are being defined by people who don't even speak those languages, at least on this scale. And that's a really scary proposition. So whatever language you speak and whatever your level of, ex of, of experience today, you can help. Because as people who have the privilege of being aware of this problem and also being able to use computers to communicate today, it's within our power to play a role in shaping the future of Unicode and thereby shaping the future of all languages for the future of humanity. Thank you.